morning. I, uh, we are set to have a whole week of really pants weather this week. Uh, it's just gonna be rain. Today is the only day we've got that doesn't look like it's just gonna be torrential rain. So we are up here to do some bits and pieces. Mainly, one of the things I need to do is around the back where I've sown the grass and where we've got the swing seat next to the greenhouse and the barbecue, the fence has completely fallen apart around there. I mean, I say fence, fence makes it sound fancier than it is, but our boundary has kind of fallen apart. So I have uh, brought the drill with me today and I'm just going to use a load of our like scrappy bits of wood that we've got uh, just to kind of bolster that up and get that back to being a boundary rather than just a collapso. That's the first job on my list. And I'm also up here to pick up some stuff once I've got that done. Um, firstly, the guttering for sowing the first lot of peas, very exciting. Yeah, so that's what we're up here to do today. Um, first job is I'm gonna go and assess how bad the fence actually is because from here, it looks like just one bit has kind of fallen down, but I need to put some other bits in and it's lost a leg. <laughs> So I'm going to go and sort that out, then find some bits of wood, then we'll screw them together. Oh, another thing, it's really windy out here today. It's not raining, which is marvellous, uh, but it is really windy. So I apologise if the camera falls over because you are a little bit of a sail on this stand. <laughs> Oh, it's a blustery old mess out here, chap. So this is the fence that I'm talking about. You can see it is just uh, broken in the center there. So it's just a chicken wire fence um, with these upright posts. And uh, what is here has got a bit wobbly. So I'm probably not gonna replace them, but I'll put a couple of extras in. The chicken wire is all still intact. Uh, but what I've been doing slowly is as I was kind of taking the old raised beds apart, I've been putting the uh, pieces that were sort of partially intact across the bottom like a kickboard which has really helped strengthen the whole thing and given me something to staple the chicken wire to at the bottom which has given it more strength this end i hadn't got down to yet didn't have enough boards left over and so uh, it needs a bit of help up and sort of like in a line again but I'm gonna have to put that it's not called a skirting board but you know what I mean like a kickboard for it all the way up this end and I don't have any wood for it at the moment and what I think I'm gonna do is go and buy some featherboard from B&Q just to get that in on this edge sorry it's really windy <laughs> I hope it's not going for you on the sound um, but yeah because I can't really straighten it up until I've got at least one more post to go in the bottom you know to like go straight down uh, vertical and I don't have any uh, flat boards to go across I've only got one and it's really thick and it's just a waste to use it for that so I mean I've got it upright at least it's not going to go any further now and then just get some board along the bottom here I can staple the chicken wire to it and that will sort this all out on this edge uh, Ron's built up quite a bit of soil against this side so having a kickboard across the bottom would really help with that too I don't know whether I need to replace that. That post is just rotted off straight at the bottom. So I might uh, take that one out and put a new one in there. But yeah, don't have any board to do that with at the moment. So, so I'm going to have to pick some up from somewhere. I've got these ones, 
which uh, I fixed the side of the shed with. They were great for that, but they're just too flimsy. I mean, it's just like using cardboard to hold a fence up. It's not really gonna work, but it did a fantastic job on the bottom of the shed. Do you remember this? Patched a load of rat holes. <laughs> hey, Lily, we got all the rat holes, didn't we? Yeah, we did, bunny rabbit, yeah. But this is the stuff I'm gonna get. It's just uh, featherboard, b and cheap as chips, and uh, it's pretty strong. Anyway, enough of that. I've got chopped down some raspberry canes. for this. I'm very happy to say that all of our raspberries that we've got are autumn fruiting raspberries, which means that they are a lot easier on the pruning front. This time of year, once they've lost their leaves, you just chop the whole lot down and that's you done, as opposed to the summer fruiting ones where you have to prune out the last year's fruiting canes and leave the summer growth on. Autumn fruiting raspberries, you don't need to deal with any of that nonsense. And also, I particularly like autumn fruiting raspberries because getting berries and soft fruit that late in the year, there's something particularly nice about it when everything's starting to fade and you've still got masses of raspberries to pick. I love them. You can chop your raspberry canes down any time, really, between when they lose their leaves and spring before they start really kicking off again next year. I'm doing mine earlier rather than later because I'm going to be using the canes themselves as pea supports and I want to give them a bit of time to dry out. Because if I chop them straight off here and stick them in the ground, in all likelihood, they will just grow more raspberry plants. And that's not what I really want from a selection of peas. It's sort of added raspberries. So I'm chopping them all down now and I will just give them a bit of chance to dry out for a couple of months before I stick them in the ground. Clearing the raspberry canes now is also pretty handy because we've got a lot of work to do in this fruit cage before spring hits. Uh, behind these raspberries we have the grapevine and that needs pruning and the raspberry stems are really prickly and a bit of a pest really. <laughs> so getting them out the way means that we can get on with the other jobs in here. Interestingly, having them a bit of a pain and prickly and gnarly uh, makes them excellent for pea canes because the peas can get a grip on them a lot more easily than they can, say, a bamboo cane or a straight cane. They get their little tendrils wrapped round and they can really get a grip on the prickles. So yeah, it is all go. It's all go. I'm gonna store these canes in my cane storage unit until I'm ready to use them. <laughs> this is just the upright pallets which form the side of my compost bin, but it makes excellent cane storage. Storing canes horizontally, uh, they tend to rot out if you're storing them outside. And I always find if I start trying to put them in the shed or in the netting shed and they fall over and it just gets into a terrible mess and I end up snapping most of them. So being able to just store them upright like this keeps them dry and keeps them out of the way. The bamboo canes reach right down to the bottom, but the raspberry canes I've just kind of jammed in the top, which means that they won't root. Like if I put them in the soil, if I put these right down to the bottom, they would probably root, which would be annoying. Um, but just keeping them up this way and keeping them off the soil at the bottom there will stop them rotting out and they'll be perfectly dry when I'm ready to make my pea structures, which I was looking through the archives and this was me making my pea structures last year. You can see because the raspberry canes are slightly curved, you can get a really, really nice shape. It's all terribly neat and tidy and just a bit of string will hold it all together and your peas will be incredibly happy with you. <laughs> Next thing on my list today, though, is rhubarb. OK, those four rhubarb that we transplanted have all just look, they look like they're going. Look, they are happy chaps. So that's exciting. I'm going to cover two of these and try and get some forced rhubarb this year. I know it's their first year in the ground and I should be leaving them to settle in. But I want this. I want it badly. <laughs> this is forced rhubarb. So by forcing the rhubarb, you're blocking the light out of the early growth and you get this incredibly pale, sweet, delicious, tender, magnificent rhubarb. <laughs> it's just fantastic. Normally we cover the rhubarb with much larger containers than this. And I'll have to swap these out for something bigger as they grow because we normally use something like one of the water butts upturned or in this case last year, we used the leaf mold bin. 
but due to poor planning my water butts are all full of water and my leaf mold bin is full of leaf mold <laughs> so i'm a bit limited in what i can cover them with at the moment so i'm going to start them off just with these little pots because i don't want them to get going too quick without being covered the two little rhubarbs under these pots will outgrow these really quickly and so i will need to look for a taller alternative although the original victorian terracotta rhubarb forces were only quite small but i much prefer a big pot so you get some really long stems the process does weaken the plant and so i wouldn't do it to the same plant every year so in this bed i've got the four different ones and i'll do two and two each year and i also won't leave them in the dark for too long so i get one really good growth spurt from them and pick a load and then i'll uncover them you can see in this bed the difference between what's been covered and what hasn't. But by the end of the season, the plant that have been forced will recover just fine and look exactly like the other plants by the end of the year. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's hope for magnificence, huh? Right, I am freezing cold. I need to find that gutter. I think it's in the netting shed. Yep. Fantastico, fantastico. God, the sun's gorgeous, but it's so windy. So windy, it's impossible to film. <laughs> and, um, and also it's just, you know, when it gets really windy, it just kind of gets into your bones. And the moment, because the sun's like coming in and out and in and out. And the moment the sun comes in, it's like, oh, not comes in. The moment the sun comes out, it's like, oh, it's just beautiful for like 10 seconds. And then it goes in again and then it's blooming cold. Oh, 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 sun. See what I mean? That is just bliss. It's gonna go away again any second. Yeah. And it's gone. Definitely time to head off and sow peas. <sighs> peas. <laughs> right, I've got my drain pipe. I managed to bring it home without forgetting it, which is good. But what I did forget again was the end pieces. But yeah, actually I seem to remember that the ends I found really difficult to get off last year and um, I messed up my peas when they were in there and I sellotape works just as well so i am going to tape up the ends of my drain pipe it's not a drain pipe it's guttering sorry just guttering it doesn't have to be strong i mean it's not waterproof tape or anything but they're not actually going to be in here very long and once the soil is sort of compacted in there it doesn't move anyway it's just to stop it coming out the ends while I'm sewing them really So peas, this is quite early to sow peas. Um, not for if you're doing pea shoots or something, it's not, they're fine for that, but. Um, if we have a mild spring, it'd be perfect. I'll get them out. But likewise, if it turns out that it's gonna be absolutely freezing during spring, I might just eat them as pea shoots. Um, just got, depends what the weather does, really. Right, that is that. Excellent. Right, compost. So the idea of sowing peas into guttering like this is that you can start them off super early. So they're just starting them indoors like you would in modules or pots. But when it comes to planting them out, you just dig a trench and you're able to slide the entire lot out straight into the trench and they're already planted rather than fiddling around planting individual pea plants. I'll generally only do my first sowing in guttering, possibly a second depending on how the season goes. But after that, I tend to just direct sow peas straight into the ground because transplanting pea plants I find really fiddly. Right, I've left the peas upstairs. Let's go and get the peas. 
Right, let's rummage around in here. Where's my peas and beans section? There we go, nice and drawer. <laughs> right, oh, come on, get it out. There we go, lovely. Right, so that's the Eleanor Express that are going to be my spring broad beans. What have I got on my beans? French beans, Bellotti beans. Uh, more French beans. Who are these peas? Is that them? I oh, know that's Sutton broad bean. Uh, give me a second, I'm going to rifle through this. Okay, it's not absolutely marvellous. <laughs> I think what I thought I had as a packet of peas has actually turned out to be broad beans. Pants. <sighs> not the best, um, but you know, I'll just leave this until tomorrow. It's actually my niece's 21st birthday today. Um, so I'm just going to abandon this guttering full of soil and go to the pub. I better sort myself out first though. Beautiful. <laughs> Again, we're going to go and pick up some peas. <laughs> Timed that perfectly, didn't we? <laughs> it's been dry all the way up until we've decided to leave the house. Hopefully, it's just going to be a short spell, and by the time we get out of being q it's going to be beautiful sunshine. <laughs> blue sky. <laughs> <laughs> Does it mean spring to spring peas? Harvest it, yeah. I'm not going to be fixing the fence, am I? So we're going to go up and have a look at the dahlias because uh, that's something we really need to sort out this year because, um, yeah, anyone will explain when we're looking at the bed. <laughs> and then uh, head home and sow the peas. Not bad. 
the gloriousness of this camellia. It's like it's covered in fried eggs. <laughs> It's the most beautiful inside. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear you girlies, what's up? What's up those girls? There's the lil. Ooh. What's up girls? What's up? What's going on girlies? What's going on, girlies? Huh? And a lil? Hello? Hello? And girls? Hello? Hello? Yeah, what are you doing? Beautiful girls. One each, they are the different colours. Gaze! First things first, we've actually gone and hidden in the greenhouse because although the sun's come out, it's absolutely freezing. Mum's on her greenhouse chair. <laughs> it's so nice and warm in here. Well, it's like 17 and a half, but the sun's coming through the bubble wrap and it's lovely. And there's no wind, which is a joy. Um, but the things that we do need to do while we're up here are um, have a look at the garlic, which I'm about to show you. Also, um, you know, we were just at B&Q. Well, we were looking at the dahlias and we've got to make some decisions on the dahlia front this year because you know, the last couple of years we've had the tulips in that bed with the dahlias and we had terrible, terrible club root in that bed, which is why... We decided to put it over to dahlias for a couple of years and just tulips and just leave it alone because it was a pain. I'm going to take a lot of that out this year and we're probably going to put that bed back into circulation, which means we're going to move all those dahlias. But there's a couple in there that we just don't really like. And that Franz Kafka one that I was talking about at B&Q, such a nice dahlia. We've had it for, what, like three years? Mm. But last year, it never even got above an inch high. Every other dahlia in that bed grew totally fine. That one just got eaten off by the slugs the moment it sprouted. So I don't know what's going on with that one. We might start it in a pot in here in the summer. I'm oh, not in the summer, but like, you know, pot it up when we move them, keep them in the greenhouse and try and get it to go before we plant it out. Because it was just useless last year. It just didn't get above the, like this high, which was weird because all the rest of them were absolutely fine. And it's a pom-pom one. We do have other pom-pom ones in there. That's a lilac one, but we have got an orange one. And uh, yeah, that was absolutely fine. Slugs didn't like that one at all. So I don't know what was going on with Franz Kafka, but the slugs are loving him. <laughs> but it's so hard to leave here when it's 17 degrees. It's so cozy. <laughs> the garlic thinks it's pretty cozy too. Look at that. It's coming up. Treat. I'm going to have to get this outside actually, otherwise it's going to be too big, too big. Most of them have come up. There's a couple that haven't really done anything. That one hasn't done anything. This one hasn't done anything, although, uh, oh. mm. that one appears to have roots. <laughs> that one was upside down. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Okay, that one. That one's empty totally. <laughs> appears I completely forgot to even plant one in that pot. Total pro. Okay, I've got to take these trays home with me too today. Mustn't forget them. And sweet peas are coming on a treat. They look fantastic. I'm really pleased with them. They look sturdy like and nice strong. And, and so many years in a row, I've just had the weediest sweet peas. So I'm feeling really optimistic. Hey, <laughs> Lil. Optimistic in here we are. Yeah, we are. Lil. 
beautiful pussy cat. Okay, we're gonna brave it. Are you ready? Well, not really, but <laughs> Oh, getting a bit sticky that door. Keep the heat in. Yep. Right, let's go and have a look at those dahlias. Okay, talking dahlias, this is what they looked like last year. They just bring so much joy. <laughs> Uh, yeah, they're just magnificent. I don't think uh, you can beat dahlias really. For cut flower, they're just the best. But we are going to try and move them this year. And to be perfectly honest, I'm a bit worried about them because we never normally have to dig out dahlias. If you've got really clay soil, you often do because they can rot out. But look at this. That doesn't look good, does it? They look really, really sad. These should be hard tubers. I'm hoping the ones that are like further underground are still really solid. Maybe it's a good idea that we dig them up anyway so we can actually just have an assess of what's under there because yeah, that's a bit of a worry. And then there's all these tulips in here which have just multiplied beyond anything. But you just never know with tulips how they're gonna come up year after year, do you? This is the year we first planted them in this bed and they're just magnificent. <laughs> <laughs> and they've never come up the same as this again as just how it seems to work although some tulips seem to do fantastically like these purple ones are really good come up the same every year and we used to have it one yellow one and one red one just the two of them in the fruit cage when it was at the other end of the plot came up magnificent every single year oh. <laughs> you're my knee Lil. that's not ideal dear i'm talking about dahlias hey fluff come on so this is the dahlias that we've got this is the orange pom-pom and in this kind of depression hollow here is where franz kafka's supposed to be but i think it's rotted out Well, that appears to be about all there is left of that dahlia tuber and it's uh, rotten. There's nothing else in there. <laughs> I think Franz Kafka has gone. But I really liked that one. So I think we might be getting that one again. So who else do we have in there? We have got the orange pom-pom one. I know that at home, I'm sure I've actually got all the original, sorry, that's a bit threatening. Um, <laughs> uh, I've got all the original like labels that came with them so I'll go through them and uh, I know which ones were which so we'll just check them over the rest of them actually look all right some of them have rotted off like the tubers that are right on the top surface but um, yeah they look all right but that one unfortunately not and there's one on the end that's the real shorty that there's no point being in that bed um, because it just gets drowned out and we're really growing them for cut flower and if their stems are only this long and the flowers this big it's not great for cut flower <laughs> so that was a bit of an error I didn't look at how tall that was when I bought it so we'll probably plonk that in the uh, bed that goes around the pond so it's not going to waste but it's going to go in there but yeah so that's the dahlia situation I'm gonna have to have a think about that the tulips is just another story entirely but mum loves tulips but they're just not like dafts are they <sighs> yes i haven't made a decision about what to do for them yet but um, i do think that bed is going to be cleared we're going to use that this year and the one that we're going to move the dahlias into is actually going to be a bed that's in the full sun down there that is this bed down here that had the strawberries and rhubarb in it so the strawberries are being shunted sideways they're going to grow underneath the asparagus in the big asparagus bed that is uh, between this bed and the barbecue so there's going to be strawberries and asparagus in there and then this bed as basically probably the sunniest bed we've got so we're going to stick the dahlias in there we've got gladioli bulbs in there that's the second asparagus bed but look at this i'm not happy yeah i'm feeling really quite disheartened about what's going on in the perennial brassica bed actually two of the uh tree cabbages are fine 
Um, one of the Nine Star Broccolis looks fine. One of them looks semi-okay, but there's some very sad cases in there. Ooh. <laughs> if ever a plant didn't look happy, it's this one. I mean, it's just rotted off, froze and rotted off. They smell horrific as well, like rotting cabbage. So that tree cabbage is looking good. That tree cabbage is looking good. The uh, Nine Star at the back there is looking fine, but I mean, the two on this edge, I just don't think they're gonna do anything. I'm hoping they're gonna sprout from lower down. Like I said last week, I'm hoping that all this top growth has just, you know, gone kaput and it's gonna start sprouting from lower down, but sad times, sad times. We are not used to this. We don't have enough like polytunnel plastic to cover this whole thing or even to cover them up um, as your individual plants. But what we do have is a couple of large rolls of the EnviroMesh. You remember me talking about how the EnviroMesh is really, oh, I'm threatening you again, <laughs> um, how the EnviroMesh has really, really helped protect the chard that's underneath it, the Lucullus. Well, I think what we're gonna do is just chuck one of the um, big rolls of EnviroMesh that's on the battens over the top of this because we've got this nasty snap coming again. Not anywhere near as cold as it was. I mean, it's not going to be minus eight. I don't expect to see that for another couple of years, or at least I hope. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to have to change the way I garden. Um, but yeah, uh, what was I saying? We're going to chuck that over the top of these and hope because it's going to be about minus three in the next couple of days. So yeah, poor little chaps. I mean, they look so sad. Look at them. And I mean, considering our normal gardening weather here, our normal winter temperatures, like there's tough as old boots. Not now we've had a taste of real cold, it's not. Oh, so sad. frost dew it's absolutely freezing my hands are icy and the sun's gone behind the trees now so now the temperature's just gonna go yeah right and I've got to sow those peas this afternoon and also I'm thinking about onions you want my fingers up now Mum's cold. Mum's cold. <laughs> Are you ready to go home? I am. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's even warm enough to put the hot chocolate on. It's too cold. No, me. yeah, it won't light the no. stove, I don't think. No. Okay, I think it's probably time to head off. We're going to go home. <laughs> What's the weather forecast for tomorrow? Right, are we ready to close up? Yeah.
Okay, <laughs> let's go for peas, round two. Got my gutter of compost and I'm gonna sow the peas straight into it. Last year I sowed my peas ultra thick and I had a lot of people up in arms about it. Well, I had fantastic peas last year, <laughs> particularly the first two sowings that were both really, really thick and went out super early. Great peas, um, but I'm not gonna go as thick this time, mainly because I've only got this one packet and I want to do at least two gutter sowings of this. So I'm just gonna use half the seed and I think it's gonna mean that they're a bit wider spread than they were last time, but it should be fine. You don't wanna sow them too sparingly if you're doing them in the gutter method because you need enough in there that the roots are gonna to mesh together. So when you slide it out, uh, they stay together. If you've only got like peas down the center, you know, in a long line, uh, they're not going to have meshed the compost together and it's not going to work and they're going to go all over the place. So you do need enough in there that they're going to hold that compost together. And obviously, if you were going to grow them this way for pea shoots, you would sow them like triple density to these ones are. OK, it took two days and a trip to B&Q in the middle, but peas are done. <laughs> uh, I'm actually going to just give them a really light watering because that compost has been outside and uh, it's wet and freezing cold. I stuck it outside last night and uh, yeah, beautiful. So I just give it really light watering. Uh, you've got to be really careful when you're planting in the drain pipes though because there's no holes at the bottom so you don't want to flood them. Uh, one advantage of having the sticky tape on the ends is that it does still drain out whereas if you've got like the pop proper uh, guttering ends it's all locked in there. So you've got to be a bit light on the watering. But yeah, starting off with soggy compost really helps. Okay. Let's stick these chaps out in the conservatory. sow some onions. I don't normally grow onions full stop. Uh, this year it seems like I am. <laughs> uh, I've got some sets in the ground. I don't know if you remember, I've got a whole bed over two onions from sets, which is something I never said I would do because I don't really understand how you put a small onion in and you just get a slightly larger one later on. But by the by, Johanna really over ordered on her onion sets and so she donated some to me and so I thought may as well put them in. Even if I pick them really early and they're really tiny onions, um, still using a bed, isn't it? So that's all right. Um, but I was watching uh, Green Side Up, Steve, doing Boxing Day traditional onion sowing. And I've got quite a lot of onion seed upstairs. It's like one of those ones that sort of, you get free on the front of a magazine or comes through the post or I don't know how you collect seeds. It just seems to be plenty of them around. Um, but I've got a lot of different varieties of onions and most of them say to sow them around March, April time. But I've got a couple of varieties that say kind of between December and April. And Steve was saying that uh, it's traditional to sow them on Boxing Day. I didn't know that because I'm not an onion sower. But there we go. I'm going to have a go with Isla Craig. <laughs> uh, I seem to be setting myself up here because, you know, I have terrible problems with Allium leaf miner and Allium white rot and all of these things. So why I'm going all in for onions this year, I don't know. But I'm going to give it a go. So they don't need heat to germinate, so they're not going to be taking up any space on my, uh, you can just see this kind of glow happening over here. That's where I've got the heat mats and the grow lights on the chilies and tomatoes. Not tomatoes, I haven't started them yet. The chilies and the aubergines, which I'll show you in a minute actually, because lots of them are up, which is pretty exciting. But yeah, I'm going to sow these and then they're going to go out into the conservatory, same place that the peas are and uh, we'll see what we get. Bit of a gamble, but they don't take up a lot of space and uh, might as well have a go with them. I think, I think Steve said they take about, it's about 13 degrees sort of average temperature that they want and that's about right that's out there. So do a nice tray of onion. Nice and flat. It's 
actually not very many in there. So I'm going to do the whole lot. I would tip them straight from there and do sprinkle, sprinkle, but the sun's gone down because it's winter, you know, so the sun goes down at like four. <laughs> and it's about half four and it's really dark in here and the soil's dark, obviously, and the seeds are black. So I'm going to tip them in my hand first so I've got some sort of idea that I'm not just pouring them all into one corner. See, they're really difficult to see. Well, while we're out here, let me show you this uh, <laughs> just embarrassment. I uh, got some chilies off these. These are the ones that I rescued from the polytunnel, but it got so cold out here in this conservatory that the plants are gone. I've just got to pick these ones off and I'm going to just dry them. Uh, look, so that is the hot lemon and this is the Brazilian starfish, which I'm pretty excited about because this is pretty much the entirety of my chilies from 2022. It was a bad year. <laughs> Talking of chilies, let me show you what's come up in the propagators already. So that was only, what, last week that I sowed them? They're whizzing along. Just nip around this corner. Let me show you propagation station. <laughs> so these are the heated propagators and we have got aubergines and chilies coming up uh, just like rockets in there, which is pretty good. Got some other bits in there. These are those long-legged cucumbers, which I think I'm just about to pot up. I'm going to get a glass of wine and I'm going to pop these things up. So the poor little things have got their lights on them now, so they've stopped growing like snakes. But these are the lights I use. I get asked a lot whether or not these lights are any good. And I've got to be honest, I have nothing to compare them to. I know they've made a big difference to what I can start at what times. They have made a difference to my seedlings. But how they compare to other setups, I really have no idea. Seems these are the only ones I've ever had. Oh, cheers, chaps. Bit of a weird, bitty week this week, wasn't it? It was generally just being cold and <laughs> ducking in and out of the shed. But it uh, turns out we've got quite a long video, so this is going to be a very short ending. <laughs> I was just looking at the weather forecast, and the weather forecast is looking fantastic for next week. We've got like four full sun days. It's going to get down to minus three, so it's going to be a bit chilly. But uh, it doesn't really matter if it's not blowing a gale. Like, I don't mind it if it's just cold and sunny. That's just beautiful. It's just the wind. The wind gets you down after a while. And the poor girlies, they hate it. You know, they're covered in feathers. Obviously, being chickens. <laughs> but they're covered in feathers. And every time the wind blows, oh, whoosh, and all the feathers go up. And they, oh, poor little loves. They hate it. Lil hates it, being that fluffy. You know, all the fluff buffeting her all over the place. Yeah. Nobody likes it windy, but the wind is going to drop next week and we've got some beautiful sunny days and I've got loads to do. So I'm going to dig up those dahlias that I was faffing around with uh, this week. Uh, we have decided we are definitely going to move them. Um, and I do think that digging them up uh, just to see what's underneath there is probably a good idea. Lots of places you have to dig your dahlias up every uh, like winter. So in places where you've got really heavy clay soil or it's like waterlogged, you always have to dig your dahlias up. Uh, us being sand, we've never had a problem with it before, certainly never had one rot out. Uh, so that Franz Kafka one that's just vanished is a complete mystery. Complete mystery. What else is going to happen next week? I'm going to try and get the garlic out. Fab. Something else that's happening next week, we have some manure coming. You know normally uh, we have that one huge delivery every year where we get like 50 bags. Um, well, we found somewhere, just another allotment site near us that actually has like an allotment shop. I know, dead fancy. <laughs> they have a proper allotment shop and uh, obviously they buy it in bulk like we did with the 50 bags, but it means that they pass it on to the allotment holders and we've joined their allotment association. So we can now buy at the same value that we get it at 50 bags ago, but buy it in dribs and drabs rather than having to do the mammoth uh, manure day. 
So we're going to be spreading some manure around next week. Uh, I've got quite a lot of beds that desperately need it. Uh, the raspberries that I chopped down uh, this week are going to have some leaf mould and some manure on them. Uh, the asparagus uh, needs a bit of manure. Yeah, it's all go. <laughs> It's all go. I've got quite a bit of planning to do next week as well. I've been uh, looking through tomato varieties, although I'm not sowing my tomatoes yet. I've been getting very excited about them. Um, so it's all, it's all go. It's all go. Can't believe we're halfway through January already, though. <laughs> it's a bit of a worry, isn't it? <laughs> but yeah. So anyway, chaps, uh, this was meant to be really short. I'm just going to say uh, cheers. We've got good weather coming up. I hope you've all had a magnificent week. It's a happy Monday to the Patreons and it is a happy Tuesday or whichever day you're watching it for everybody else. Uh, cheers, chaps. Cheers.